This is a brief review of ototoxic pollutants and hearing conservation. I am Ishaka Rahul. I serve as the chair and professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Mississippi. This presentation is given on the occasion of the World Environment Day 2022 due to an invitation from Dr. Rangasai on behalf of the Audiology Committee of the International Association of Communication Sciences and Disorders. Before we begin, I need to declare some potential conflicts of interest. I am employed by the University of Mississippi and receive a salary from them. I'm the author of two textbooks published by Theme, Hearing Conservation in Occupational, Recreational, Educational and Home Settings, and Auditory Processing Deficits, Assessment and Intervention. So I receive royalties from Theme. In addition, I am a member of the following organizations, Acoustical Society of America, American Academy of Audiology, American Auditory Society, Association for Research in Otolaryngology, American Speech Language Hearing Association, International Society of Audiology, and the National Hearing Conservation Association. Some substances or energies can pollute the environment because of high level production, for example, very loud noises, and or because they are not dispersed or diluted quickly in the environment. These are referred to as pollutants. The substances can be in the form of solid, liquid, or gas. The energies can be in the form of heat, sound, radioactivity, or light. Pollutants can contaminate air, water, or land. Some examples of specific types of pollutants include noise, chemicals, and plastics. According to the UN Environment Program, environmental pollution, chemical exposure, climate change, and ultraviolet radiation contribute to more than 100 diseases that primarily impact the most vulnerable populations, such as young children, or older adults. According to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration of the USA, ototoxins can be classified into three categories, cochlear, vestibular, and neural. Cochlear ototoxins affect sensory hair cells in the cochlea, leading to hearing impairment. The vestibular ototoxins affect hair cells in the vestibule of the ear or the organ that assists us with spatial orientation and balance. The neural ototoxins affect the neural pathways responsible for good hearing and or balance. Some examples of ototoxins include asphyxians, metals and compounds, solvents and very loud sounds. Examples of asphyxians include carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide and its salts, and tobacco smoke. Examples of metals include arsenic, organic tin, mercury, manganese, and lead. Examples of solvents include carbon disulfide, ethyl benzene, n-propyl benzene, toluene, and hexane, styrene, and methylstyrenes, etc. Very loud sounds can occur in the form of any noise or even very loud music. Other ototoxic chemicals identified by the U.S. Army Center for Health Promotion and Preventive Medicine include diesel fuel, kerosene fuel, jet fuel, JP8 fuel, organophosphate pesticides, and chemical warfare nerve agents. As we all know, individuals exposed to excessively loud noise are at risk for hearing loss. If the noise is above 130 dBA, even a brief exposure can damage the auditory system. An example of a chemical asphyxiant is carbon monoxide or CO. 
exposure to carbon monoxide can reduce oxygen delivery to tissues or oxygen used by tissues. The resultant oxidative stress leads to overproduction of unstable and reactive oxygen species that can damage cochlear cells and neurons. For example, excessive glutamate release is apparent in the synapses under the inner hair cells from carbon monoxide ototoxicity. This can lead to hearing loss. Here are some places where harmful exposure to carbon monoxide can occur. These include boiler rooms, breweries, warehouses, petroleum refineries, pulp and paper production, steel production, and around docks and blast furnaces. Some occupations that can lead to possibly harmful carbon monoxide exposure include welder, garage mechanic, firefighter, organic chemical synthesizer, metal oxide reducer, longshore worker, diesel engine operator, forklift operator, taxi driver, marine terminal worker, and toll booth or tunnel attendant, customs inspector, and police officers. In many of these occupations, hazardous noise exposures can occur simultaneously. Exacerbation of hearing loss beyond that caused by noise alone can occur at carbon monoxide exposure levels of 200 parts per million. Carbon monoxide poisoning after short-term exposure can cause sensory neural hearing loss with full or partial recovery. The OSHA US standards for carbon monoxide exposure prohibit worker exposure to more than 50 parts of the gas per million parts of air average during an eight hour time period. The eight hour permissible exposure level for carbon monoxide in maritime operations is also 50 parts per million. Workers must be removed from exposure if the carbon monoxide concentration in the atmosphere exceeds 100 parts per million. Let us review some examples of ototoxicity from heavy metals. Saunders et al. evaluated 59 inhabitants of the gold mining community of Bonanza, Nicaragua. They measured fingernail metal levels, established auditory thresholds, and recorded distortion product autoacoustic emission levels. Results showed widespread hearing loss. Nail metal concentrations of mercury, lead, aluminum, manganese, and arsenic far exceeded reference levels. Several young individuals with high metal levels reported neurological symptoms and had poor hearing. The investigators concluded that metal levels in mining communities present a significant public health problem and may affect hearing. Now let us briefly talk about lead toxicity. Lead is a natural bluish gray metal. Exposure to lead can occur from breathing, workspace, air, or dust, and consuming contaminated water or food. From a wider perspective, in 2019, lead exposure is estimated to account for 900,000 deaths and 21.7 million years of healthy life lost due to the exposure to lead. The highest burden was in low and middle income countries. The Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation also estimated that in 2019, lead exposure accounted for 62.5% of the global burden of developmental intellectual disability whose cause is not obvious, 8.2% of the global burden of hypertensive heart disease, 7.2% of the global burden of the ischemic heart disease, and 5.65% of the global burden of stroke. So how many workers are exposed to lead in USA? Approximately 804,000 workers in general industry, including manufacturing, wholesale trade, transportation, and recreation are exposed. 
Additional 838,000 workers are exposed in construction. When does lead exposure occur? During the production, use, maintenance, recycling, and disposal of lead materials and products. Here are some examples of common jobs with lead exposure. Painting, building renovation, radiation repair, bridge work, shooting range work, demolition, battery manufacturing, metal production, metal scrap cutting and recycling, ceramic work, soldering, and plumbing. Lead can damage heart, kidneys, and the reproductive system. It is also neuro and autotoxic. Blood lead levels of greater than seven micrograms per deciliter are significantly associated with hearing loss in the three to eight kilohertz range. We will now briefly discuss mercury. Metallic mercury is a silvery odorless liquid as seen in thermometers. It changes to a colorless and odor-free gas after heating. Exposure to mercury can occur from breathing air contaminated by mercury or skin contact with mercury. Metallic mercury is used in the production of chlorine gas, caustic soda, and mercury batteries. High-level mercury exposure can damage the nervous system, kidneys, and developing fetus. Mercury compounds such as methyl mercury chloride and mercury sulfide are autotoxic in animals. Organic mercury poisoning in humans can also be toxic to the auditory system. Here are some examples of mercury autotoxicity. Andean children who were exposed to mercury vapor from gold mining operations showed auditory brainstem abnormalities. Long-term methylmercury exposure appears to delay auditory brainstem response latencies with incomplete recovery. Here is an example of autotoxic occupational mercury exposure. Abdul Rasil and colleagues conducted a cross-sectional study of 138 workers in a fluorescent lamp factory. They evaluated the environment of workers to document mercury and noise levels. They recorded the urinary mercury levels of each participant and conducted neurobehavioral tests, spirometric measurements, and audiometric examination. The mean value of urinary mercury level was significantly higher among those who showed behavioral changes, hearing loss, or had other manifestations related to mercury toxicity. The authors concluded that there is a need for effective preventive programs at fluorescent lamp industry workplaces, especially in countries with the most unhygienic ill-ventilated conditions. Here is another example of methyl mercury poisoning through food in Iraq. In this case, homemade bread was prepared using grain treated with methyl mercury fungicide. Bread consumption began in October 1971, and the first severe case was admitted to the hospital in December 1971, followed by more than 6,000 hospitalizations and 500 deaths. Several symptoms were reported depending on the dose, including paresthesia, ataxia, dysarthria, and hearing loss. Methyl mercury exposure can also occur due to consuming fish contaminated with mercury. In 1960, mercury in the hair samples of residents on the coast of Chiranui Sea was 10 to 20 times higher than that in individuals in non-polluted areas. People on the coast of Shirinai Sea continued to consume fish containing low-dose methylmercury until 1968. 
The long-term effects were evaluated 10 years after the dispersion of methylmercury. Participants in the fishing village called Oura on the coast of Shirnai Sea showed a significantly higher prevalence of neurological signs characteristic of methylmercury poisoning compared to people in a non-polluted fishing village called Ichiburi. The signs that were seen were hypostasia, hypoxia, hearing impairment, visual change, and dysarthria. 53% of individuals in Ovira showed hearing impairment, while only 13% of individuals from Ichiburi showed hearing impairment. It is important to monitor methylmercury in communities with high fish consumption. The blood methylmercury levels of adults with high fish consumption should be monitored. About 200 micrograms per liter, corresponding to 50 micrograms per gram of hair, may lead to a 5% risk of neurological damage to adults. As a reference, the consumption of 200 grams of fish containing 500 micrograms of mercury per kilogram will result in the intake of 100 micrograms of mercury. For prenatal exposure, 5% risk may be associated with a peak mercury level of 10 to 20 micrograms per gram in the maternal hair. Methylmercury impedes the growth of the fetal brain and the movement of neurons from the embryological generation layer to the final target in the brain cortex. In the presence of high mercury levels in maternal hair, dietary recommendations should be made with consideration to overall nutrient intake. This is because fish contain nutrients such as omega-3, iron, iodine, protein, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and selenium. Certain fish have low mercury levels like tilapia, whereas other types of fish have high mercury levels like the big eye tuna. Arsenic exposure can occur through drinking well water. 10 year old children in an arsenic polluted area can show hearing losses at 125, 500, and 8,000 hertz. These children were living near a power plant burning coal with high arsenic content. Compared to people who use tap water, people who drink tube well water contaminated with arsenic show significantly worse hearing thresholds at 4, 8, and 12 kilohertz. Arsenic can accumulate in the inner ear and significantly decrease auditory neurons and fibers. Now we will talk about solvents. Worker exposure from organic solvents can occur due to presence of solvents in several products, including paints, varnishes, lacquers, adhesives, glues, and degreasing cleaning agents. Exposure can occur during the production of dyes, polymers, plastics, textiles, printing inks, agricultural products, and pharmaceuticals. The most frequent exposure to solvents occurs due to the exposure to a mixture containing mainly xylene, toluene, and methyl ethyl ketone. However, workers in the glass fiber reinforced plastic industry can be mainly exposed to styrene, and workers in the rotogravure printing industry can be exposed to toluene. So how many workers are exposed to solvents in the USA? Approximately 9.8 million workers are potentially exposed to organic solvents. Solvent exposure is associated with high frequency hearing loss. Benzene, ethyl benzene, and toluene concentrations are associated with increased adjusted odds of high frequency hearing loss. High frequency hearing loss in this study was defined as average loss in air conduction pure tone thresholds at 3, 4, 6, 8 kilohertz greater than 15 dB in either year. The study used multiple multivariate logistic regression models to assess the associations of individual organic solvent exposures as measured by blood biomarkers with audiometrically assessed hearing loss. 
models were adjusted for age, gender, race, ethnicity, diabetes, non-occupational noise exposure, smoking, and income. Jet fuel contains ototoxins such as enhexin, enheptans, toluene, and silane. Jet fuel exposure increases the adjusted odds of a permanent hearing loss when it is combined with noise exposure during the first 12 years of exposure. The adjusted odds of hearing loss increase by 70% with 3 years of exposure and by 140% with 12 years of exposure. Solvents may compromise the protective role played by the middle ear acoustic reflex, thus exposing the inner ear to higher noise levels. Now we'll briefly talk about styrene. It is a colorless, oily liquid that evaporates easily. It is absorbed through skin or airways. Styrene can cause damage to several organs, including mucosa, liver, kidneys, respiratory system, and the central nervous system. It has the potential to cause cancer in humans. Examples of industries that can expose workers to styrene are plastics, glass fiber reinforced plastics, synthetic rubber, insulators, and some agricultural products. Workers who are exposed to both noise and styrene have significantly worse auditory thresholds between 2 and 6 kHz compared to those who are exposed to only noise. Workers who are exposed to a mixture of solvents with styrene as the main component and noise are more likely to have a hearing loss than workers who are exposed to only styrene or only noise. noise. A high frequency hearing loss can occur even in workers who are exposed to both styrene and noise levels that are just within the permissible limits if the exposure occurs for five or more years. We'll now talk about toluene. It's a colorless liquid with a distinctive smell. Toluene can be absorbed through airways, skin, and the digestive tract. It can damage the central nervous system and liver. It can irritate the respiratory tract. Examples of industries, processes, where workers can get exposed to toluene include leather tanning and printing, painting, and where lacquers, dyes, and degreasing agents are used. The odds ratio estimates for hearing loss are greater in rotogravure printing workers who are exposed to an organic solvent mixture of toluene, ethyl acetate, and ethanol. Combined exposure to noise and toluene can be more damaging compared to exposure to either noise or toluene alone. With toluene exposure, central auditory abnormalities can occur, including stapedius reflex decay and auditory brainstem response abnormalities. The next solvent we will briefly discuss is enhexin. It is a colorless volatile liquid with a disagreeable smell. A very high percentage of enhexin can be absorbed by inhalation, which is then distributed to tissues and organs rich in lipids such as the brain, peripheral nerves, liver, spleen, kidneys, and adrenal glands. Workers in the following industries can get exposed to enhexin these include textile, furniture, printing, and shoe industries. Chronic low-dose exposure in industrial workers can cause axonal loss with sensory impairment. Subacute high-dose exposure in glue sniffers is neurotoxic, can cause swelling of axons with secondary demyelination, peripheral neuropathy, muscle wasting, and weakness. Workers who receive moderate exposure to enhexin and toluene are more likely to have hearing loss compared to non-exposed population. 
the risk of hearing loss is greater in workers who are exposed to noise in addition to these solvents. Now we'll talk about xylene. It is a colorless, aromatic, volatile liquid that can take three forms or isomers, metaxylene, orthoxylene, and paraxylene. Xylene occurs naturally in petroleum and coal tar. Xylene exposure can occur through inhalation or skin contact. Workers in the following industries can be exposed to xylene, including paint, biomedical laboratories, metal, furniture, and automobile garage industries. The prevalence of hearing loss among workers in a liquefied petroleum gas infusion factory is about 56.8% in the presence of relatively low noise doses. There is also a risk of hearing loss from environmental exposure to organochlorine pesticides. Serum alpha hexachlorocyclohexane level, which is a metabolic of organochlorine pesticides, is a risk factor for increased prevalence of hearing loss. Higher serum levels are correlated with worse hearing at mid and high frequencies. Blair et al. showed that hearing is significantly worse at 2000 Hz in the metal exposure plus solvent exposure plus continuous noise group compared to the continuous noise only reference group. The metal plus solvent plus continuous noise exposure group has a significantly greater relative risk of 2.44 for developing a standard threshold shift at 2000 Hz. The hearing loss from noise exposure typically is more prominent at or about 3000 Hz, while combined effects of simultaneous exposure to autotoxic substances and noise are noticeable at or below 2000 Hz. Combined exposures to autotoxicants and noise present a greater hearing loss risk than just noise. We are familiar with the effects of loud noise on human hearing and health. However, Marine species are also affected by noise. Examples of sources of noises affecting marine species include shipping or seismic air gun surveys used to detect oil and gas. Marine species rely on hearing for food finding, reproducing, communicating, navigating, and sensing their environment to avoid predators and hazards. Effects on noise on marine species include hearing loss, temporary up to months or permanent, permanent cellular damage to auditory neurons, severe internal injuries, disorientation, and death due to massive acoustic trauma incompatible with life. Five strategies can be used to protect hearing. The first strategy is to monitor exposures to determine if the exposure levels are harmful. For example, we can monitor noise levels through dosimetry. We can monitor pollutant levels in water, air, and soil, and blood and hair samples. Second strategy is to reduce exposures at the source. For example, we can play music at softer levels, use chemicals that are not hazardous, ensure clean water through protecting valves, filtration and treatments, improve ventilation through engineering controls. The third strategy is to use protective measures when exposures cannot be reduced. For example, we can use protective gear, including gloves, earplugs or earmuffs to minimize loud noise exposures, dietary recommendations in communities with fish consumption, with high methyl mercury levels. The next strategy is to train communities about pollutants and their effects on health, including hearing and balance, ways to control pollution, and protective measures. The last strategy is to monitor the auditory function for those who are at risk for hearing loss or balance dysfunction. In monitoring the auditory system, we should consider the sites of effects. Different pathogenic mechanisms may be involved that may act on sensory receptors, 
nerve fibers, and the central nervous system. The peripheral hearing assessment should include air and bone conduction thresholds, speech reception thresholds, speech recognition score, at most comfortable levels in quiet and noise, photoacoustic emissions, tympanometry, and acoustic reflex thresholds. Uh, here is a recommended central auditory processing test battery for workers exposed to ototoxins. So there are several tests that are recommended here, including diacortic speech processing, binaural summation, temporal processing, and degraded speech. We should keep in mind that a single individual can be exposed to multiple ototoxins. Here is an example of a patient we saw who was exposed to a variety of ototoxins, including pesticides, herbicides, mercury, arsenic, lead, diesel fuel, carbon monoxide, thorium, carbon tetrachloride, styrene, and trichloroethylene. In addition, he was also exposed to noise, uh, although he was wearing earmuffs, high vibrations, and heat. Here are the key references. Thank you for listening, and happy World Environment Day.